everybody. Welcome to a virtual lecture for Monday of week five for Econ 180. Um, so it's Monday, September 27th, or someday around then. Uh, we don't have class that Monday, so I wanted to go ahead and give you guys a heads up on what we're going to be talking about this week. We do have a short chapter this week. I want to review a little bit of what we did last week and then get us started on urban sprawl and land use control so that when we do meet up back in person again, on Wednesday the 29th. Um, we won't have lost any time um, and we'll be ready to go ahead and just keep chugging along through Bruckner's work. So in week four last week we talked about the modifications of the urban spatial model. Remember the urban spatial model helps us explain how cities behave, how they look, what we see, the patterns that emerge, density, building height, price of land, price of housing, size of housing, all of those expectations emerge from that first assumption in the urban spatial model about the central business district and the commute time. Um, the modifications we looked at last week are, uh, first we looked at relaxing the assumption of uniform income. So we said if there's two income groups, the group willing to bid the most might live closest to the central business district. There's empirical and theoretical evidence for both cases. Uh, we talked about gentrification, right, that maybe high-income households will prefer newer housing, and so we're going to see poorer households tend to live in older housing, and then as the old housing stock is replaced, um, then we see rich households move in. We talked about how it might be a function of mode of transportation. Maybe low-income households just don't have access to private cars as much, so they need to live in the center city in the central business district so that they can access public transportation. Uh, maybe it's urban amenities. Maybe high income households want to live in the city center because of beautiful architecture or access to um, entertainment or restaurants or something like that. And that's going to depend on the kind of city, right? Maybe the urban amenities in Paris are not the same as the urban amenities are in St. Louis, uh, for example, although St. Louis does have some pretty cool museums and architecture. Um, so really what there were are a lot of different models of how two income groups would behave in a city. And there is empirical and theoretical evidence for a bunch of different versions of how that would redistribute. And so we don't have one answer. We don't see one answer in the real world, so that makes sense. We talked about commuting by freeway, right? The idea that there is this freeway catchment area. So if we go from our original model of uh, the central business district and a bunch of roads radiating out, if instead we add in a freeway, that's gonna lower the transportation cost once you access it. What we're gonna see is that's going to tend to alter the freeway catch, it's gonna create this freeway catchment area that's gonna give us this different city shape that's a function of access points to the freeway. So these little purple lines are access points to the freeway and they create divots in the city edge where we're gonna see, uh, say, um, this housing be lower cost than this housing because of access to the freeway. So basically what we're just going to see is it's going to change the pattern of um, that commute cost, that change in X, um, because of that freeway area, that freeway catchment area. And so there's an even better drawing than mine that looks at commuting by the freeway. And so we say that A might have um, the same commute cost as B even though B is further away because of access to the freeway. Um, and so it really depends on where the freeway is, what the access points are. What we're really saying here is a freeway would change the model in a very expected way because it's going to change commute costs. Um, we also talked about employment outside of the central business district, right? This idea that people might find a job somewhere else. The basic um, implication of this model is that we would see the worker compensation change relative to the distance. So if I get a job that's further away from the central business district and closer to me, that might lower my commute cost and then I might see my income also change um, in response to that because it's less costly for me to get to work. Um, we could also see two 
central business district, sort of a central business district and a secondary business district. And that gave us this cool two peaked model where we have two sort of city centers and people are going to live around those two city centers. And so we can see these lines falling as being the rent curves or the price of housing curves. And so it's most expensive around the central business district, but it gets cheaper as we move away. And then again, it's expensive around the secondary business district and gets cheaper as we move away. And there's this point here in between those two curves where you're sort of indifferent between being on either point, uh, on either curve. Um, but if, say, I lived um, here next to the central business district, but commuted over here to the secondary business district, that'd be called wasteful commuting. Or if I lived at B and worked over here at the central business district, that'd be wasteful commuting. Why would people do that? For lots of human reasons, right? Uh, family, um, maybe you have two people in your house who work, maybe moving is costly, lots of reasons. So we do see evidence of wasteful commuting, and so it's not super surprising. So now we've got employment outside the worker, um, the central business district. We've got the secondary business district. We can also talk about how technology lowers commuting costs and increases sprawl. That's super relevant these days. Um, sorry, go back. Um, so we see a lot of that effect happening in cities like San Francisco and the Silicon Valley area, right? The lower commuting cost has increased sprawl as people choose to live further and further away from their central business district um, because they no longer have to drive to work every day. They're only driving to work once a day. So we're going to see that increased urban sprawl um, lead to people leaving, living further away from the central business district than they would before. Um, we also can talk about, and we also talked about durable housing. And this is a really cool model. It can be kind of intimidating at first, but the idea here is that housing lasts a long time and then becomes old and needs to be demolished. And so we'll see the city skyline change depending on which factors are the most important in terms of um, oh, how high we build the building. And so um, we basically model two different building imperatives um, that explain the variety of urban buildings in terms of age and height. So we have two effects. We have the age effect and the distance effect. And so the age effect says that newer buildings will be taller than older buildings. The distance effect says that buildings that are closer to the central business district will be taller than buildings that are further out. And so what that gives us is these two different models that have sort of two different saw edges. And it's a function of which of those factors is more important. Because if you think about having a central business district, right, um, you're going to start building your tallest building in the center and then shorter and then shorter and then shorter. Um, but then the age effect says that the older buildings will actually be taller than the previous buildings. So if this is T1 and this is T2 and this is T3, if the age effect is stronger, we'll actually see them get bigger, not smaller. And so what we're really trying to explain here is that there's a lot of variation in buildings because the newer buildings are taller but there's also an incentive to build densely in the city center. And so it's much more complicated than we originally thought, right? And that makes, again, sense logically. That's what we see play out. Um, and then one of the last things we talked about was this idea of rural urban migration. The idea that a rural resident earns an income, that's that agricultural income, YA, um, and we're going to assume it's lower than urban income. Um, we're going to assume that there's no commute cost because they're just there, they don't have to drive anywhere, they just live on their farm or whatever, and so their disposable income is equal to their income. And then we say that their decision to migrate is going to be based on the disposable income. So they're going to only move when that disposable income from being in the city, y minus tx bar, is equal to or greater than their agricultural income. And we use the edge residents, remember, because that's the urban incomes they're going to be able to see, right? That's sort of the easiest to perceive. So they'll look to the city's edge and say, oh wow, you're making way more money than me, I will move to this city, or 
oh, wow, your disposable income is really low because your commute time is really high, I'm going to stay in the rural area. And there are a lot of factors that can disrupt that equilibrium, one of which is changes in the population, right? If the population increases, that's going to increase the city's edge. It's going to have the effect of um, increasing the city's edge and lowering that disposable income for the urban individual. So the equilibrium is determined under this rural urban migration process. And so it's very much a model in flux. Um, so we see the equilibrium occur when the population is such that disposable income in the city is equal to agricultural income. Um, and then we can actually complicate the model further when we talk about rural urban migration um, and say that there might be a, um, a probability effect in there. Um, so in developing countries, we see low rural incomes drive low income households from the agricultural outsides of cities into urban areas for those higher disposable incomes associated with living in the city's edge, even if there's a very long commute, um, because the incomes are considered much higher. Um, we still might see high unemployment in those developing countries where a lot of rural industry, it, it, um, a rural residents are being attracted because they might misperceive the probability of getting, getting a job. And so we can add in one more variable, which is J for jobs. And remember that if J divided by L is the probability of getting a job, the number of jobs divided by the number of people looking for jobs, and we multiply that by income and we get the expected income, which is Y times J over L. Um, and so we can see that as L increases, longer commutes, um, reduce disposable income and reduce expected income, but as J increases, the expected income rises and that attracts more rural income, more rural migrants. And so there really is an incentive um, to migrate to the city, especially when we see really poor um, rural areas. This week, the next chapter we want to talk about is urban sprawl and land use controls. And here we're talking about what incentives push that city edge out and make those suburban areas so undense. Um, so we're going to look at empirical evidence on spatial size of cities, market failures and urban sprawl, land use controls that are used to try and prevent or attack urban sprawl, and then some other kinds of controls. So we start out with this quote, the unplanned, uncontrolled sped, spreading of urban development to the edges of the city is a great definition of urban sprawl. And it has negative connotations. It's maligned for uh, eliminating agricultural land, right? It's a bad thing. It's eliminating agriculture. It's wiping out open spaces. It's creating pollution and congestion as people drive further. And it's depressing inner city development. And this gets to some of the stuff we talked about when we talked about two incomes, right? Um, rich people are moving out into the suburbs, buying mega homes and driving an hour into the city while the poor are left to live in dilapidated housing in the city center. Uh, critics argue that urban sprawl contributes to downtown decay, reduced social interaction, and increased obesity. We are going to look at the empirics, though, because we are economists here, and we look at the data. So, first, Birchfield in 2006 and uh, their co-authors used satellite imagery to measure spatial growth of cities over time and found that developed land is growing, right? From 1976 to 1992, developed land area grew at a rate of 2.5% per year. So that's pretty significant. We're seeing that developed land grow. We are seeing urban sprawl develop. On the other hand, we see states enacting growth management policies, trying to manage the spatial growth or the footprint of the city. And that sometimes includes buying up vacant land to prevent development, right? So sort of protecting green spaces and that kind of thing. So we see that happen in a couple of different cities. Um, in California specifically, we have a program called Plan for the future that's designed to preserve and enhance the quality of life by ensuring efficient use of natural and financial resources. And the, basically, the, what the, you know, this is all very lovely, optimistic language about promoting livable communities, providing better housing and transportation operations, conserving natural resources, open space in the environment, and protecting agriculture and forest landscape. And the idea here is to mitigate the incentive 
to overdevelop the land and engage in that urban sprawl. Just like everything in economics, though, these things come at a trade-off, right? We're, so we're talking about not developing as much land, which means we're not developing as much housing, especially if we think about how much housing in California is actually high density. Um, but there's a lot of this movement, especially in prosperous communities, to limit growth and try to limit urban sprawl because it has all these negative connotations. Our urban model answers some of these questions, right? We see that um, increased population is going to move the city size out, increased incomes, increased transportation costs, and changes in agricultural land rents. Those are all going to affect that city's edge. We have a mechanism and a model for describing that. Um, there were also some empirical results. So there's two papers referenced here. The Bruckner and Fansler paper is pretty old, uh, but the McGrath paper is from 2005. And McGrath uses CPI data, and Bruckner and Fansler use these sort of proxy or instrumental variables to try and estimate the effects of population income transportation cost or a commute cost and agricultural land rent on the city's edge. And so here's a table of the results. And so what we're looking at here is how, what the elasticities are associated with these different variables, right? So we can see here that both of them find a little bit of a positive um, effect of population on the city size, right? The population increases, then the city size increases. Bruckner's is a bit stronger than the McGrath model. The commuting cost results are not great for Bruckner. There's not really an effect. McGrath gets a negative effect. So as commuting costs go up, the cities are going to tend to shrink or the city's edge will not get bigger. That fits with our model. Income, again, we see strong results with Bruckner and Fansler, softer results with McGrath, but still what we expect higher incomes, bigger city's edge, a positive relationship. And then agricultural land rents show a negative effect, but again, pretty small. So what, did this tell, what does this tell us? It tells us that empirical evidence confirms the urban spatial model and that that model can help us reliably and practically understand the expansion of cities, at least according to these two papers. We can also think about, so this helps us think about um, urban sprawl in a different way. If the evidence confirms our model that urban expansion is a product of higher incomes, more people, lower cost commuting, what's the problem? Um, as long as agricultural rents are appropriately high, we'll see productive agricultural land be preserved relative to cities. Um, so what forces are actually motivating these growth management policies? What's telling local governments that they need to stop developing, right? It's, it sort of gets back to that urban economics axiom, this idea that the prices adjust to achieve locational equilibrium. If the value of land, agricultural land, is not high enough, then we should develop housing on it, right? We should use the most... Um, productive, we should use the land for the most productive use. Well, there's some other things we might see. So one of the things we might see is there might be a market failure. And the market failure we're thinking about here is what's called an open space amenity. And the open space amenity says, hey, there's a value to undeveloped land um, just in and of itself. There is an unperceived value. Maybe the market doesn't see it, but when I go out and stand in an empty field or in a forest, I enjoy that. It has value even if it's not market value. And so that would be our open spaced amenity value. And the market's not going to see that. So maybe the undeveloped land is more valuable than that agricultural land rent curve is saying. So this is going to give us a new way to model city's edge that takes into consideration the fact that maybe the value of the land that's not developed yet isn't just to produce agriculture, maybe there's other value associated with it. So suppose each acre of agricultural land yields B dollars of open space amenity benefits. Um, when making decisions, landowners are only going to consider the urban land rent R and the agricultural land rent R a, right? 
that's what we've looked at so far. So let me draw this up. Um, we can use the sort of classic economic idea of a um, social planner, an omniscient social planner, or maybe a local government that would take into consideration not just R and RA, but also the value of B when deciding whether to develop land. Okay, so what that would look like, give me a second to get some pens up here. Let's hope you can see this. So we would have what we had before, right? We have distance from the central business district, price of land. We've got our urban land rent curve. And then we would have our agricultural land rent curve. That would give us an equilibrium, right? That's our city's edge there. But if we wanted to fully consider the open space equilibrium, what we would want to do is add the value of B in and say, hey, this land is more valuable than just what we can produce on it. So maybe there's actually this R A plus B and this would be the socially optimal city size. Does that make sense? So it's a lot like a standard externality model where what we're looking at is a situation where there's additional value, additional marginal benefit beyond what the market perceives. And so we're going to underproduce rural land. And if you don't like this graph, there's a graph over here. So, suppose each acre of agricultural land yields B dollars of open space benefits. When making decisions, landowners only consider R or A. So a city planner would want to um, base the decision not on whether R is greater than RA, but whether R is greater than RA plus B. And the city boundary, the new equilibrium, occurs at R equal to RAB, right? So in the presence of an open space amenity, the socially optimal city is smaller than the free market city, right? Because of that open space amenity value that the market misses. So here's what we have, right? So we have the agricultural land or the urban land rent R0 initially and the agricultural land rents RA and our initial city size. If we add in the urban space amenity, we'll get this RA plus B, this new open space externality um, value added in that's going to push that city's edge all the way in to over here where we're at an equilibrium with RA plus B. What that's going to do, however, is there's going to be a little pushback from the city. And you can see that in this second land rent curve, R1. Um, when we push the city's edge in, what we're going to do is shrink the city down while the population stays the same. So we're going to see it get a little more denser, the land be a little bit higher value, and that's going to try and push the city's edge back a little bit. And so we would see some pushback from um, this initial, right, where we're at R not RA, to maybe R not, or sorry, R1, RA plus B. Does that make sense? So in my model, what we would say is, okay, this happened. And then because we shrank the city, all of this city land is going to go and get more expensive because we've reduced the amount of housing and the amount of property that's in the city. So it's going to raise agriculture, or it's going to raise urban land rents to... R1, and that'll give us a new city's edge, a new equilibrium. Does that kind of make sense? So basically it's pushback from the city. We can't just shrink the city without there being an effect on density. Does that make sense, hopefully? But the basic idea here is that these open space amenities give us a way to 
think about the value of undeveloped land. So what policy prescriptions could we apply? How could we solve this problem with government policies or something like that? We could tax developed land and raise the price, right? Just impose a tax of B to every, um, to every new development to try and internalize that externality. If landowners had to pay a tax on each acre of land developed, it would internalize that externality for them, right? Um, and then the city's boundary would be set to that new socially optimal equilibrium, that X bar that takes place where R is equal to RA plus B. We've internalized the externality. It's a really classic way of internalizing an externality is impose a tax. Here's the problem. Who gets the benefit from the open space amenity and who bears the harm from the tax? Right? City residents are going to face smaller dwellings in a more expensive city with higher rents and somewhere out of the city's edge is some open space amenity. Normally, the additional open space benefits would increase the utility for all residents, but the reality is people in the central business district might not enjoy the open space amenity. So the reality is most people want open spaces to be near them not just out there somewhere, right? Um, it's, it's all fine and well to know that the beach is out there, but I want to be close to it so I can go there, man, right? So that's one of the problems. How important are open space amenities in a practical sense? It depends. City residents value parks, but if all the parks were located at the city's edge, that would be problematic. A development tax might be preferred and it might be a nice economic solution, but it does make urban residents worse off. It harms them without um, compensating them, right? And so here I've got, this is a picture I took of a park when I was visiting my friend in Manhattan and she was like, oh, you have to come. It's the most beautiful park in all, in all of New York. It's not Central Park. It's, I think it's Washington Square Park or something. Um, but that's an example of an open space. And so I think it's useful to think about how valuable these open spaces are, whether they're in the city center or at the edge, and how do we put a value on those open space amenities? How do we internalize them? And, and who bears the burden? And who gets the benefit? And, and sort of what is the benefit of an open space amenity and how do we define it? So um, especially I think we get a little spoiled when we live in places where we have access to beautiful open space amenities, right? The mountains or the beach or rivers and lakes. Um, and then we remember that there are people in cities like New York that are very dense cities and their version of open space is this park here. Um, so I think it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, so that is one of the ways that we could deal with urban sprawl. And one of the ways that urban sprawl can be subsidized, right? If we're not internalizing that open space amenity externality, that open space externality, if we're not thinking about that additional benefit that's not being realized, we're gonna overproduce cities. So the next market failure is traffic congestion. We have so much to talk about with traffic congestion. We're just gonna so we're just going to talk a little bit about traffic congestion and then we'll talk about, we have a whole chapter where we really model traffic well. But the main thing we want to think about here is, first of all, traffic generates externalities, right? It represents another market, market failure in the sense that each additional car creates costs to society beyond their own private costs, right? Um, commute times go up, um, which raises the cost of commuting. There's also environmental costs, increased probability of accidents, etc. So the private cost of commuting is that T, right? My own private cost times X, how far I have to commute. We did look at the cost associated with that opportunity cost, uh, but we haven't talked about the social cost, the cost created by me going on the freeway and being one additional car on the road, right? Um, so I don't know if you're like me, but when I get on the road, I think, oh God, any car in front of me is one more person who is slowing me down. That's what we're going to think about. So there's a private cost of commuting, that TX, um, but there's also a social cost associated with commuting. And that's the externality damage done to other drivers in the form of a higher commute cost, right? Each additional car, car, each additional vehicle, each additional driver slows traffic down 
and generates that negative externality, that higher time cost of commuting. And so if we wanted to, we could internalize that with tolls, um, some kind of toll that raises the cost of driving, forcing commuters to face that social cost. Uh, we're not going to get into this now. Like I said, we'll do a whole chapter on traffic. We'll talk in detail about what kind of tolls would be efficient and how we would enact them and how people have, there are countries that have enacted them. We're going to talk about Singapore, who's done a really good job of it. Um, but the big idea here is what impact would that have on our spatial model? We kind of already know that, right? We've talked about it because raising a, a toll, creating a toll would raise the cost of commuting. It would raise T and that's going to result in a smaller city, right? It's going to increase the benefit of being at the city center, increase the cost of being at the city's edge, shrink the city and decrease urban sprawl, right? Give us a denser, smaller city with more people in it, right? So we kind of know that. So that's one thing we could do. If there's a negative externality, we can impose a tax or a toll to internalize it, charge people to drive, and then that's going to increase the cost of commuting, raise T, shrink down the city, make X bar smaller. Um, how is this different from other changes in T? Um, one is that the congestion um, costs associated with uh, increased population are going to be a function of that population and of the city size. And so if we really want to internalize the externality well, we can't think about a toll in the traditional sense of like, oh, well, I drove over a bridge, so I pay a toll. We have to think about a toll that takes into consideration distance from the central business district, population density, and those kinds of things. So something that's a little bit more nuanced and detailed than just, hey, it's 20 bucks to drive into San Francisco. Um, so it would, would increase the incentive to live close to the central business district and shift that land rent curve so that it's, um, it's much more expensive to live further out and cheaper to live closer. Um, there is evidence that a proposed congestion toll of 17 cents per mile would be enough to internalize the negative externality associated with congestion. Uh, mathematical analysis indicates that appropriate tolls would probably decrease the city, the average city by 10% and increase city density. Um, however, even though economists all agree that this is a really good idea to help decrease congestion, decrease city size, um, increase city density, and make the world kind of just a better place, um, it has not been implemented as a policy in the United States. Why not? Well, what would you say if I said you're going to have to pay an extra 17 cents per mile to drive in the city of Sacramento? Would you be happy about that? No, it's super, super unpopular, so no politician wants to implement it. Um, and it would probably be regressive. It would harm low-income households more than high-income households. Um, so it's not been implemented because it, it'd just be super duper unpopular, even though it's a really good idea. So we are just going to have to deal with traffic, I guess. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about is some of the other distortions that contribute to urban sprawl. Uh, we'll talk about these other distortions. Um, and then next time on Wednesday, when we're back in person, we'll review all of this a little bit. And then what we'll spend some time talking about is the empirical evidence on urban sprawl and whether we actually see it do what people say it does. Um, so one big source of urban sprawl distortions is a government failure. There's usually a huge difference um, between the subsidization of urban infrastructure versus suburban infrastructure. And that's because it tends to be funded through property taxes. And so what we see is the entire city's property taxes go to pay for any infrastructure builds. Expanding the city's edge is going to create new suburban neighborhoods that are going to require a lot of new costly infrastructure. And that's going to be subsidized in part by urban residents. So that means that the suburban residents who move in after the development has taken place have had some of their infrastructure already paid for by the people who lived in the city first. And so that basically means that current urban residents subsidize future suburban development. So that's a distortion. It's a byproduct of the way our taxes work and the way we pay for infrastructure, um, but it does subsidize 
suburban development. It makes it cheaper to build the infrastructure associated with um, those suburban sprawl areas. Uh, one way to solve this is to have um, suburban housing um, pay impact fees. And these impact fees are basically developers have to pay extra for the development of the land because they're having an impact on local infrastructure. And so um, they have to pay extra for that development. And then theoretically that fee would be passed on to the household who buys the home um, so that they're actually being charged the true marginal cost of giving them roads, giving them sewers, giving them electricity, whatever infrastructure we're speaking about. Um, so that's one way to internalize that um, and it's becoming more popular. It raises the cost of housing, but it's already having been subsidized, so it kind of makes sense. Other distortions coming from the government, the housing tax subsidy. Um, in the United States, one of the biggest subsidies, one of the biggest ways we subsidize housing is a mortgage tax deduction, which says, hey, um, we will let you deduct a large amount from your taxes for your mortgage payment, which incentivizes having a larger mortgage, which means taking out a bigger loan, buying more housing. Um, it's one of the big ways, one of the biggest ways that we subsidize home ownership, incentivize home ownership, subsidize the consumption of higher quantities of housing, um, and that's going to contribute to that urban sprawl. Gasoline subsidy, U.S. has some of the cheapest gasoline in the world, and that means that we are paying less to commute than people in, say, Europe, and so that's going to help increase urban sprawl, lower the cost of living in the suburbs, living further away from the city center. And then also we see government restrictions on urban land um, and the subsidization of agriculture have a disruptive effect. So we can think about um, restrictions on high density housing, uh, government restrictions on what type of housing can be developed, or um, just the permitting process, raising the cost of housing development and the effect that might have is going to be distortive. And then subsidizing agriculture, that actually goes the other way. If we subsidize agriculture, which we do to a very large extent in the United States, um, and most economists agree that's a terrible idea, what we're doing is raising that agricultural land rent curve. And so we're actually making cities smaller by subsidizing agricultural land. Um, I don't think that actually plays out as directly as the model might want us to see because a lot of the heavily subsidized agricultural land is going to be the main grains, right? You know, corn and soy and those kinds of things. And we don't see a lot of those being farmed outside of cities, um, we can still see that having an effect. If you subsidize the production of agriculture, it makes the returns to agriculture look better, raises that RA, that agricultural rent curve, and pushes the city's edge in closer to the central business district. So that's all I've got for y'all for this virtual class. Uh, next time on Wednesday, when we come back together and meet up in the classroom, we'll talk about urban sprawl and blight and the empirical evidence about it, whether urban sprawl truly is um, making us sedentary, making us less social, and um, making cities uglier. And so we'll look at the empirics and talk some more about what y'all think about this chapter and what else we can um, learn about urban sprawl. So let me know what questions you have. I'll pop up a discussion thread on Canvas. We'll do some more work on this on Wednesday. Otherwise, I hope you have a glorious day. Take care of yourselves. Be healthy. Go drink some water. And I'll see y'all next time. Thanks.